title, as you know, is uh, Global Communication, Interreligious Dialogue and Friendship. My friends who know me know that I always talk about the Jesuits. <laughs> but this time, this time is not uh, an artificial thing because the most famous Jesuit in China, uh, Matteo Ricci, the one who founded the mission, wrote an aphorism, or a collection of aphorisms, 100 aphorisms on friendship. Basically, and I, I, I'm going to give you in a moment, uh, 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 he begins saying, I came from the far west, basically, uh, to meet with the uh, king, the son of uh, heaven, you know, the emperor of Ming, and I met a prince who welcomed me and told me, how much uh, uh, he welcomed always those people that were virtuous and they were friends for him and that he wanted to know how people in the West talk about friendship. And so, uh, Matteo Ricci, who had a fantastic memory, because obviously he didn't bring any library from the West to China, but he remembered uh, readings from the Greeks and the Romans, the Latins, and of course, Renaissance humanist, and as he said, from his own memory, from things he had this uh, childhood, then he wrote this book, became immediately what we could call a bestseller in China, said, went through many pirate editions, or even there were pirate editions of the book, and basically uh, became a classic in Chinese precisely on friendship. I'm going to... Um, uh, let me look at the next, actually. There you have it. On the left is Matteo Ricci, or he's an old man. And on the right is one of the first Christians somebody who was a great mathematician himself. Together, the first book that Matteo Ricci uh, uh, published in Chinese was The Principles of Euclid. And they basically wrote the book together. Those were very close friends. And this book that I meant, that I showed in English was first translated, which appeared only in Chinese, and was only translated in English in, I think, in. 2005 by Columbia University Press. And let me, oh, I forgot. Uh, I thought I, I brought with me. Let me see if I, if I have brought. You. Yes. I'm only going to read the first aphorism to give you a sense of uh, the way he talks about friendship. My friend is not an other but half of myself, and thus a second me. I must therefore regard my friend as myself. And then it goes on and on, and, and it's extremely deeply uh, uh, book and aphorisms on friendship. But I wanted to use it because obviously the Jesuits in China began a mission that was characterized by, by what is called uh, we would call today inculturation. They call it accommodation. As you can see, he's not dressed as a Westerner. He's dressed as a Confucian literati. First, he and Michele Ruggeri, that were the first ones that started the mission in China, uh, they were told by Balignano. Balignano was the visitor in Japan, in the mission in Japan that was started by Francis Xavier. And he realized that and this is what the Japanese Christians told them. Look, if you want really to bring Christianity to China, or excuse me, to Japan, you have to become Japanese first. You have to dress like Japanese, eat like Japanese, wash yourself like Japanese, not like Westerners, and basically. And the idea was precisely, and he repeated, our task is not to Portugalize, because then it was came to Portugal, Portugalize the Chinese. 
but to make Christianity Chinese. And Christianity will become Chinese if we ourselves, those bringing Christianity to China, become Chinese themselves. And Richie basically that's what he did. He embodied himself through this friendship relation, learning from the other, from the culture, so that he could communicate. It was interesting about this friendship aphorisms that it again is a mixture of, if you wish, Western classic Christian philosophy and Chinese philosophy. He, he, the, the aphorisms are written already for the Chinese public. He knew the classics so well that he became respected as one of the greatest Confucian scholars of his time. And actually, he tried to convince the Chinese because he was so impressed by the ancient classics, the Jesuits had started the gymnasium or the uh, collegium through the process of what they call the Ratio Studiorum. And it was Renaissance humanism. And they talk of Saint Cicero. They made the Christian pagans into saints because they learned from them, from the Stoic, from the Greek philosophers. So they were brought into the core of the Jesuit education. And Ricci said, if we can make a saint out of Cicero, the more so we should make a saint out of Confucius. Because he says, Confucius is the closest thing you find to revelation without revelation. He's the closest thing to natural law, to what could be called, later will be called, uh, uh, um, natural theology. So natural law and natural theology. And he was convinced that actually Confucianism at first, when they talk of the Lord of Heaven, they talk of God the Creator. Unlike the Confucians of his time, that was Neo-Confucianism, that was non-personalistic principle, and he tried to convince them that actually you have abandoned the true Confucianism, and really the true Confucianism can be best interpreted through precisely revelation. Besides this book on friendship aphorisms, he, I mentioned he wrote the uh, uh, Euclid geometry, then he wrote a catechism, precisely the uh, teachings of the Lord of Heaven, and this was the religion the Chinese call it the religion of the Lord of Heaven. Um, and this is the way in which Christianity came known uh, until the Protestants changed the name. There is a question with the names of God, etc. The, the division, the Jesuits also fought over it. And then he, and I'm going to show it in a moment, another aspect of this uh, uh, friendship. I'm sorry because I'm talking and doing these things at the same time. And it's not Okay, uh, he became <coughs> equally famous for this. This is the first map of the world in Chinese. Of course, the Chinese had not heard of the new world. And what is interesting, this is a map that, again, is a practice of the culture of the encounter. What the Pope calls the culture of the encounter. This is what the Jesuits were practicing in China. And here again, it's a, an encounter between Western cartography, which Ricci brought. He had a study with Clavius, the great mathematician, astronomer at Collegio Romano, and had learned astronomy enough to be able to do this map and all the the uh, uh, equations of all the, the uh, measurements. And Chinese cartography, as you can see, you have a lot of text inside the map. This is the way the Chinese do maps. And what is interesting about this map is that you look at the center, is neither China nor Europe. So it's not a Eurocentric map, but also not a, a Sinocentric map, because the Chinese were used to 
is the Middle Kingdom and the center of the world. And actually, this is west, but the America, which usually appears as the west, appears here as the east. So again, it's a way of decentering both the Chinese-centric system and the Euro Eurocentrism. It's a way of present. They came there not to bring Western culture. The model they had was Christianity has no culture. Christianity was a Jewish Hebrew religion that could only become other by becoming Greek and Latin. So this whole Christianity became Greek and became Latin from the beginning. And we know, of course, Byzantine Christianity, Roman Latin <coughs> Christianity. And there is no reason why, and in so doing, of course, took Greek metaphysics and Greek philosophy and took Roman law and took Roman ethics. There is no reason why Christianity can also not become Chinese and Japanese. And the only way in which Christianity can be universal is if it becomes the robot, I'm sorry, from America. <laughs> Calling from America all these robots that they call about 30, 40 times a day. I'm sorry, I, I forgot to close it. So the idea was that Christianity can only become a universal by becoming particular everywhere. And so the model was precisely in culturation. The Jesuits became Chinese in China through Ricci, through uh, um, in India. Roberto de Norville became a Brahman, dressed like a Brahman, ate like a Brahman. Uh, the first Western to go to Tibet, uh, Ippolito de Sideri. So the first actually Orientalist, but not in the sense of Orientalism of Western hegemony, because what makes the Jewish country interesting, they came with the Portuguese and the Spanish Empire to the frontier, to Macau. But inland to China, they went without power, uh, alone dressed, first they were dressed like Buddhist monks, and then eventually like Confucian literal. The same thing in Japan, they came to Nagasaki with the Portuguese, but to Tokyo and Kyoto, they went along without power. Hippolyto de Sideri went to Tibet without power. So it was an encounter of equals before Western hegemony. So it was not trying to westernize the Chinese. Christianization, yes, because they were missionaries, of course. But the idea was that the same way with the Guaranis in Latin America, they didn't even teach them in Spanish part of the Spanish-American empire, but the Guaranis never left the Spanish. <coughs> the Jesuits there, and of course the interesting thing about you, you saw the names. Uh, uh, Matteo Ricci, an Italian. Italy didn't have, didn't have colonies, so it was not like Spanish Jesuits, Portuguese Jesuits, that were basically representatives of the colony. After the next astronomer after Matteo Ricci was Adam Schall, a Bavarian, then Ferdinand Berbius, a Belgian. So people that had no colonies became Jesuits and were not there to expand or to bring the Spanish empire, Portuguese empire, but really Christianity. So what I'm trying to present is this notion in which precisely you have the first system of global communication. I mean, we know so much about the Jesuits because unlike other orders who didn't re leave records, the Jesuits simply not only reported everything, but sent. They, they were supposed to basically send letters to Rome every at least once a month. But they knew that half of the letters are lost given the existence of communication at the time. So they sent always two copies of letter. One through the Portuguese system going from Goa uh, around Africa to Lisbon and then to Rome. The other from, uh, let's say, China, Japan, to Manila. Manila at the, at the time was really a, a, a center of the communication between Europe and uh, uh, Asia through the Americas, from Manila to Mexico, and from Mexico to Spain, and then to Rome. So every letter came one by the Portuguese half of the world, the other by the Spanish the other half of the world. And sometimes you will have Jesuits that one will come to to precisely to China through, uh, with the Portuguese through Africa, Goa, the other will come. And so they together very frequently, the Jesuits really circumnavigated the globe. 
And, and they created, the, what made the Jesuits unique is that they were also the scholars, all of them. They, the founders were seven people, graduates from the best university of the time, Paris, right? So imagine seven guys with PhDs from the University of Paris at the time. Was the, and at first, they didn't want to become teachers because Ignatius thought they should be mobile and they should be ready to go anywhere in the world where they were needed. And that's why they had this vow of obedience to the Pope it was not really to obey the Pope, but was to have universal jurisdiction because the Pope is the universal bishop of Rome. If they said we are sent by the Pope, we have the right to go everywhere, anywhere, without having to get the permission from the bishops, from the kings, from anybody. So it was this which gave them the global mobility to be always on the move. But then came the idea in Messina, the people came and said, well, we would like to have a school. You, you, are, you are intellectuals, you are intelligent people. Why don't you build a school for our children? And they resisted, Ignatius, but then they decided. And of course, this is what made the Jesuits really good. What had been seven people in Paris, ten people uh, when the order was approved by the Pope, thousand by the time uh, already Ignatius died. And of course, by the time they were suppressed at the end of the 18th century, 1773, there were 800 colleges all over the world. Of course, mostly in Europe, but also colleges all over Latin America, college in Goa, college in Macau, college in Japan. In Japan, the college taught not only the Western classics, Latin and, and, and Greek, but also the Asian classics. So the idea, it was, if you will, the first multicultural education in which the students came from all over what were uh, uh, Jesuit missions, from India, I mean, those who wanted to become Jesuits, from Japan, from China, and together they would study both the uh, Western classics, the Christian classics, of course, but also the, the Asian classics, which was part of their education. So I'm, I'm bringing this as a model of global communication based on this notion of making friends, as we said. My friend is not an other, but another half of myself, right? And therefore, we are one. So this notion that the other is really not the other in the way in which we have made of the other and other, but this possibility, and precisely because they thought they themselves have to become either Guarani or Chinese or Japanese, they never imposed their own Western model on the others. And this, of course, something that was lost, as, as you know, partly because there was a lot of resistance on the part of the other orders because this accommodation meant uh, accepting the Chinese rights of the cult of the ancestors and of the, otherwise there was no way that any Chinese scholar was going to become a Christian if they had to give up their cult of the ancestors, the cult to the emperor. They couldn't be, they couldn't be uh, otherwise uh, uh, Chinese scholars. And the same goes for the Malabar rights in, in, in India. Now, in China, of course, it was a culture that is more or less, you could say, could be Christianized because precisely was very close to natural law, natural philosophy. <laughs> to become a Brahman is different because you are a Brahman means you cannot have relations with the lower caste. And of course, the Franciscan and other Jesuits, well, how can you be Brahmans? Then you have to follow the rituals and you cannot have any contact. So this is not Christianity anymore. Or, of course, going native means also if you are in Georgetown, the University of D.C., uh, they have the, the largest slave plantation in Maryland. So going native in the United States it means accepting slavery. And, but this is a problem we have today when we talk of human rights at universal and culture, what is particular, what is universal, which aspects of culture can we protect and which parts of culture go against human dignity and therefore we should abolish so this, this discussion we have today about human rights, are they Western rights, are they universal? Those are the issues they were confronting at the time. Of course, they found a solution. We don't have a solution today yet. I mean, the philosophers are still fighting all over it today, between universalism, particularism, we are still. But they recognize that every universalism is to be particular. 
They recognize that the global and the local, the global can only be global by becoming local, which is, of course, a weak one today about globalization. And so um, the system of communication, of course, has changed dramatically uh, today. Uh, we are talking about the digital age. And there are very interesting aphorisms that precisely show the problem. I mean, obviously, he has no idea, but precisely at the distance, and the kind of friendship that you can have, and, and the friendships, what does it mean to have a friendship when there's a real, real friendship? And um, so we know that the problem with communication, on the one hand, is the possibility of enlarging the friendships. I mean, look, look at us. Even Uku was mentioned. Uku only exists as this Catholic university because it's a global university because the Ukrainians themselves, through global migration, they have diasporas <laughs> everywhere. And it was the, the Ukrainian diasporas of the Greek Catholic Church. It's the paradox. It's a very ethnic church. It's a Galician church, <laughs> a Haletska church. <laughs> and yet, because of migration, became, as you know, there are uh, Greek Catholic bishops in Canada, the United States, in Venezuela, in Argentina, in Brazil, in, in well, of course, all over, all over Ukraine. But also, as you know, in London, in Paris, in Australia, wherever you have Ukrainian immigrants. And so it is, and of course, look at, we are celebrating every time we come, we are uh, uh, at the disposition of our boss, which is uh, uh, Professor uh, Volodymyr Tertsenovsky. And uh, of course, we are ourselves a global group from Lebanon, from uh, Canada, the United States, Spain, and so on. And, but this, and Germany, this only possible, of course, in our global days. This type of friendships and intellectual communication. But of course, and so on the one hand, the digital age makes possible that, you know, we get together and say, let's get together. And today, as I arrived in, in, in uh, uh, Lviv, already I got an email from Catherine Banner, who happens to be the great scholar of Pentecostals in Ukraine, of evangelical Protestants in Ukraine, who is organizing a conference on religions in the Black Sea region and asking me to come again to Lviv. So I'll be back in September. Uh, thank you so much. But the idea is precisely this, the fact that you can organize uh, groups. I mean, I, I didn't know anything about the Jesuits seven years ago. I never took them seriously because I thought that they had been suppressed for the right reasons. Because they were anti-modern, anti-enlightenment, uh, the most terrible popist, uh, or papists. And of course, this is part of the black legend which I found not true. They were suppressed because they were precisely, they were against the model of the Westphalian nation state, were the model of global capitalism. That's why the, eventually the kings of Spain and Portugal basically got rid of them because they were supporting the Guaranese against the attempt of the Spanish and, and Portuguese empires to basically oppress them. And, and eventually even the Pope, because the Pope couldn't control them either. So everybody hated them. The Protestants, of course, naturally hate them. The, the Jansenists in France also. But the, the other orders, the Franciscans and the Dominicans, hated them. And the, the, uh, all the Catholic kings that had used them uh, thought that they should get simply be suppressed. And ultimately, the final solution, the Jesuits have to go. They survived because survived in Catherine, Russia, mm -hmm. and in Friedrich's Prussia. He said, well, we don't care what the Pope says. We have actually, Catherine had uh, incorporated Poland, so they had Catholics in uh, uh, Russian Poland, Russia's, and they had, pro they had also Catholics in Prussia. Mm -hmm. So Friedrich said, yeah, the Jesuits are the best educators for our Catholics. Mm -hmm. Better to have them as educators than not to have others. And so they survived because of that. And, but then when they came back, they were Romanizers. They simply, they were their papists, and they just forgot their own method of uh, dialogue or the culture of the encounter, and simply, they followed the Romanization everywhere. It's only since they knew what they called the refoundation in the 60s with Peter Arrupe, Petro Arrupe, and after Vatican II, that they once again have become 
as this pope represents. Uh, those again, the culture of the encounter, he, unlike them, which have followed this idea of, of Ignatius, with the idea itself is very good. Uh, the Jesuits were the first order that in their constitution, or actually in their, uh, uh, let's say, uh, bylaws, usually the other orders had two pages of bylaws. The Jesuits wrote a real constitution, longer than many of the constitutional, I mean, of the constitutions of modern states. And it appears everything for the glory of God and for the common good. Because they, the schools were not there to make Christians out. Of course, if they make Christians yet. But it's not from this. You need to teach them humanist, Renaissance education, liberal arts, mathematics, and so on. But for the common good. This was the only justification for the Jesuits to become professional teachers. They are the first professional teaching order. After them, every other Catholic order, male and female, will follow the Jesuits in being both missionaries and teachers. But they were the first ones. And it is this combination that they could bring the knowledge from all over the world, they had missions all over, into Rome and from there distributed. They were the brokers. They translated Western knowledge, we mentioned Euclid, and the aphorisms of the Greeks and Latins, and this cartography, the knowledge, but they also brought all the classics of Orient. They are the first ones that really learned all these texts and translated them into Latin and then became disseminated because they became translated in every Western language. So they were mixed with cultural brokers between East and West and North and South. Uh, this came to an end in the 19th century when they were, came back, but then it was reborn now. And I want to talk precisely about this, uh, uh, the two sides, the youngest phase of our di digital age, that allows us to get together friends from all over the world to have projects. As I mentioned, the Jesuits, I had no idea. But you can bring to the, together, I brought 15 scholars of the Jesuits from all over. The, together, each of them knew the Jesuits in Latin America, Jesuits in China, Jesuits in Japan. But nobody, only generalists that don't know anything. Uh, they are to try to gather in you with all this knowledge, but you bring them together. So in our global age, the only way of doing really global research is by bringing local knowledge together, because it is global knowledge is always local knowledge. And it's only through this communication that really you have enrichment. Otherwise, if you are simply looking at the globe from the outside, you are a voyeur, and you are talking about yourself, not about the globe. So the only way really, really of having global communication is precisely through this, truly through this encounter, this intellectual encounter and friendship. Um, of course, they were not perfect in many respects. They, as much as they tried to get rid of their Western ideas, of course. I mean, when they discuss with the Buddhists and the Hindus about the metaphysics of the self, and especially about rebirth. For them, it was natural, taken for granted, obvious, that the soul, each soul is born unique. That's why each person is unique. And the soul doesn't die. But the other said, well, if it's born, why can I die and be born again? Of course not. It's, it's, it's illogical. But they never use. Uh, if it was knowledge from the Bible, it was not Christian dogma, it was simply the metaphysics, Greek metaphysics, the fusion of Greek and Christian metaphysics of the self, if you look at the source of the self of, of, of Charles Taylor, which they brought together as the natural philosophy, the same way that today we Western philosophers are convinced that our philosophy is universal, right? Well, obviously there are a lot of metaphysical presuppositions about the cosmos, about the self, about everything, which of course are the unthought. I mean, it is what things are, not what we think. And it is this unthought, which of course they also brought with them. And it's very clear precisely in these discussions with Buddhists and Hindus about rebirth. 
where the arguments are not, well, this is what the Bible says, this is what God says. No, it's simply, you know, they try rationally to argue with them, and they didn't realize how much they were bringing simply what is Western metaphysics about the person, which of course in Buddhism don't make sense because they have a different type of metaphysical conception of the person of the self. So, back to today, to the present. You young people obviously are the digital age. This is your age and you, you uh, 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 use this with a lot of much better than I am able to do. I'm too old to learn all these new tricks. But um, the one has to be careful precisely because there is so much conversation, so much communication without really personal encounters. And it is this personal encounter which is necessary to have real communication. Not that it has to be, uh, there cannot be personal encounter, virtual reality, but to learn how to listen to the others. Because usually when we tweet, people just are monologues, people, the way it blogs, the way things work. So how to precisely develop the culture of the encounter, not only in face-to-face -face communication, which of course is the crucial problem we are having today with the populisms, but it's, of course for us it's very easy to say, well, these populists on the right, and they would say these liberals on the left, and it's ultimately a fundamental failure of dialogue and communication that we are having today. So the, uh, uh, we have to learn how to listen, to, if you wish, to see the other as half of ourselves. Not as the other, but precisely as the opposite. And uh, interreligious dialogue is not a cognitive process of dogmatic conversation. It's not a Habermasian uh, 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 communicative uh, ethics. It's really anthropological, personal communication that is necessary. It is recognizing the other as a person with rights, the same ones as you. And therefore, it's not that you recognize the teachings of the other religion. But if you recognize the person and the right of this person to give those beliefs, then of course you can enter, not to see whether we can have a common denominator, but it's a way of recognizing each other in our dignity, right? The, the, that is humanity, which is the, the, the title of religious freedom, is based on this principle precisely. Uh, and of course, it was very difficult for the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church had maintained for centuries, you could say for millennia, the notion that it owned the truth. And now to accept the fact that it is the dignity of each person to seek the truth, and you cannot impose this truth. And then, Nostra Etate is the a Vatican document, our age, precisely on religious pluralism, that opens to interreligious dialogue. So, um, I'm sorry if it was all over the place, because it was all over the place. My lecture, and there I mean, told that I've spoken enough. So thank you for your uh, uh, patient uh, listening, and now we can communicate and uh, recognize each other. Thank you, Professor Casanova. Thank you for your very dynamic and interesting presentation. And now I have some question, but I will put it at, at the end. And now I uh, would uh, open the discussion for public and please. Well, my question is about the mission of uh, Jesuits. And it is related to the idea that, well, we as Christians have to propagate the word of God. And they were doing this, literally going to the end of the world. Because on the other side, bonum diffusivum sui, it is related to the truth. And they had to do this. They were called to do this. Why, in your opinion, they were not a wise the opposite direction of mission from Confucianism, from the Buddhist world at all. Why this didn't happen? Do they not have the idea of truth, of bonum that has to be propagated? What was the reason? 
they became because they became the object of Christianization by means of inculturation of uh, religion. Yeah, this, uh, I mean, thank you very much for this question because I was actually going to mention that they were very good in interreligious dialogue with the totally with the other, the totally other. They were very bad with the near other. So they were very bad with the heretics. They were very bad with the schismatics, without the Thomas Church in India, the Ethiopian Church, the Coptic Church in Ethiopia, or as you know, the Uniates, uh, they were in, at least they thought of the possibility of ecumenical dialogue with orthodoxy, but the model of the Uniates at the time was not really this model. Uh, so they went, and of course they had both. They had the Christian uh, uh, mission, to simply the Great Commission, go and make uh, 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 Christians or disciples of all nations, the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So in this respect, this is Dita's, their missionary first of all. And second, of course, they carry with them because uh, in the first, uh, the first task, the first awe which a Jesuit makes is to go anywhere in the world for the help of souls, and then mention, be it the Turks, meaning Muslims, or other infidels, meaning Jews, or schismatics, or heretics. So he mentioned actually, they are going to be missionaries to the German Lutherans, Protestants, and to the Eastern Christians, and to precisely the Jews and the Muslims. But there was no dialogue with Islam. The Jesuits only began the dialogue with Islam in the 20th century. With, Je with Judaism was interesting because Ignatius was extremely philo-Semite. He was a philo-Semite, and many of the first members of the Jesuits were new Christians, Jews that had converted to Christianity. It to the Fatalist book by Marix, uh, uh, a synagogue of Jews. The Jesuit orders a synagogue of Jews. And it was very well, then eventually they were forced to, to abandon, while other orders in Spain had already prohibited uh, former Jews or former Hebrew that were Christians to join the order, the Jesuits continued, and they said, how can we say it? Jesus was a Jew, right? And he said, of course, if I love, and Mary was a Jew, and I love Jesus and Mary, so I would have loved, Ignatius said, to be born as a Jew, because this is the way they would Jesus, Jesus and Mary were born. Uh, but not with the others. So in this respect, uh, they were children of their time. And so we should not look into them that they had already a model of interreligious dialogue of today or religious pluralism. Not at all. Not at all. But, I, but they had the beginning. They had a model because they went to the encounter the other before Western hegemony. Uh, it's very different from the way in which the missionaries were in the 19th century, whether Protestant or Catholic convinced not only that Christianity is a true religion, but that Christianity is also linked to Western science and Western capitalism and Western uh, power, and so all of it is part of Western civilization. So Christianity is part of Western civilization. is an 18th, 19th century product. Not yet. They don't bring Christianity as part of Western civilization. But of course they are Western. Yes, please. OK. But, uh, yeah, yes, well, uh, it's not exactly a question, but rather a corrective to what you said right now. Concerning the Uniates, um, the missionary activities do happen in the 19th century. And uh, why they didn't approach the Muslims is simply because if they tried to, they would, be, they would have been put to death. Because it is illegal in the Muslim world to try to convert Muslims from the right religion, because in the opinion of Muslims, Islam is the finality of religious belief. So, uh, as far as the Muslims are concerned, no, but in the that, that was Muslim. not an, an option. No, it was not in the Mughal Empire. They were in the Mughal Empire, and Akbar brought together Muslim theologians, and Jesuit theologians, and Hindu theologians to discuss with them, and in a context in which Islam that in the case of the Mughal, that's an exception in terms of Akbar the Great, but it's not. Actually, I understand that, but you know that, that later on you have actually persecution. But th this actually speaks more about the tolerance of Islam 
but as a policy to accept uh, proselytization that even till today, you have till today in the Muslim world, in many countries, uh, the laws of apostasy, if you're a Muslim and you become a Christian, you can be punished by that. So, wow. so that's, that's it's more a, it's more a, a, concerning, a public mobilization than actually. But uh, I concerning I concerning the unions, uh, because they could not convert the Muslims, they put all their energy, especially the Protestants in the 19th century, they put all their energy on the Eastern Catholics because they could not convert. Uh, uh, the Muslims, so they went after these retrograde, quote unquote, mm -hmm. these ancient Christians who really don't know what Christianity is. I know the uh, great history is very good and yeah. never known in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, and so on. It, this is just a correct no, no, but, but, but thank but you so much for your presentation. Uh, Not the 16th century. I was talking of the unions uh, in the 16th I century. We uh, I'm very grateful for your presentation. I learned a lot. You're extremely passionate and knowledgeable. And I respect, and I respect that because given that you're a sociologist, you're very well knowledgeable about I was a theologian before a sociologist. Ah, good. <laughs> Thank you, Yasser. Uh, I, 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 I see all the uh, all, uh, nice but I really uh, will be happy if some of our students have the possibility to put a question. It will be not a bad idea. Some of students, please now think about it in one word what we talk about. Or okay. never. No, you can think about <laughs> it in the first Let us read. Okay, okay. In the but, meantime, you but you really, you have a right to ask and also to comment, professors, not only right to hear the, the discussion, discussion between professors. You have a duty, not a right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, basically I have the question on uh, friendship and truth continuing what uh, Yuri was saying. Basically, am I right to understand that his idea of friendship was more of Aristotelian uh, ancient type when you're thinking about your friend and the, as you think about yourself a bit, or it's even further because you think your friend is half of you. And in this respect, uh, <coughs> You share your beliefs, your truth with your friends and whatever, trying to convert him or you're rather abstaining from uh, imposing something on him. What was, uh, it was just a tactic or it was just that there are deeper beliefs how to have this dynamic in the... No, because on some things, the things that they thought cannot be Christianized, they did not, uh, for the Chinese, uh, the literature of the concubines. And you could not be a Christian. I mean, he became a Christian, he had to give up his concubines to become a Christian, right? And the same goes with, I mean, there is very clear in terms of the friendship that uh, if, if, if you accept your friendship doing an uh, unvirtuous thing and you do not admonish him, then you are not a good friend. So the question is, uh, friendship requires also to have the courage to tell your friend when you think your friend, your friend is wrong. And so in this respect, uh, uh, it was not simply accommodation to the other, because this, they were accused of being simply precise, the Jesuit casuistry, anything goes. They have no, no moral spine. Uh, of course, we would call them today moral contextualists. We would call them today, right? And that's what they were. They realized that, uh, that in context, and part of their casuistry is part of this, but the notion that but they were uh, very strict on certain things, uh, having to do, and it was precisely, and those things were uh, uh, friends had to give up the things that were so painful for them to give up in a, in a situation in which having concubines or homosexuality were accepted, and they very clearly made it that you could not be a Christian with these things, or many other things as well. So it was, it was a concept of love also, it was not only Obviously, it's an Aristotelian concept, as I said. Many of these aphorisms come from the Greeks and from the and from the uh, Stoics and from the Latins, mm -hmm. but also from uh, Christian Renaissance humanism. This is part of uh, Christian, you know, uh, Christian. I mean, 
humanism, and look at Erasmus, I mean, you know, this is a, a Christian humanist, and, and they were also, it's part of, of this, of this very deeply uh, Christian renewal that, that, of which they are part of this Christian Renaissance. The only problem is that we have, we tend to view the Jesuits as the counter-reformation, but they only became this much later. At first, Ignatius was not interested, although he had studied with Calvin in the same, not with him, but in the same college, uh, that Calvin studied in Paris. But he was not, and he didn't want to send Linus and, Sal, and Salmeron to Trento. He said, it's a waste of time. They should go to missions, not mm -hmm. to discuss with theologians. So it was, he was not interested, but then Canisius, of course, became the great, the great apostle to, the, to, the, to the, the Lutherans. And of course, they enforced then, through the emperors, they enforced also the counter-reformation. So it was, it was a complex uh, situation. Thank you. So Just a quick question. And Emily, uh, at the given moment, you sound almost a, uh, like a Burberry. Uh, and you know, because of, of local reasons, you s uh, almost it, it sounds like quoting from I and thou, if you want to do. And uh, it's, it's uh, probably my colleagues will agree. And uh, just a question of curiosity, uh, how Buberian are you, Jose? <laughs> On this issue, I am Buberian, but not because I read Buber. I mean, it, it has been my personal experience that's made me Buberian. So in this respect, uh, I, I mean, obviously I read Buber, but it was not that, that I would quote Buber. And this is unfriendship, but I wanted to show that this is, a, this is what made him famous in China. The other things, obviously, Euclid geometry, they read the people that, uh, the geometricians and the arithmetic. This, the cartography, this map that was later remade by Verdiers, remained the map for China, Vietnam, Korea, and Japan until the 19th century. So this was the map that really, but obviously everybody forgot that it was done by Vinci. But it was the book, this book that became a bestseller with pirate editions, and even today, and everybody, everybody in China today knows children of uh, Madu Li. Madu Li, uh, uh, every, every, and of course, the Communist Party would love to have the Western attitude today that the Jesuits have. They put this the model of inter-civilizational communication in dialogue. So, uh, yes, uh, obviously, it's Bulgarian because uh, the context is, 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 is also necessary in the 20th century. Obviously, Jewish-Christian uh, dialogue, and then with Islam, obviously, Jaspers, uh, the Axial Age, is an attempt to go beyond, precisely, Athens and Jerusalem to incorporate Benares and China in the, in the Axial Age, so to go beyond simply the monotheistic religions and, and, and to go into really, really beyond. And this is what makes them so unique. It was not only precisely with those who are so close, but those which appear to be totally different than us. So. Professor Alon. Thank you, Jose. It's always wonderful listening to you. Uh, I agree with my colleague. It's uh, a great learning situation. Just a question. Maybe I've asked you uh, this before, but I, I don't know. I can't remember the answer. Uh, did Ricci have... Um, how knowledgeable was he of the Nestorian Syriac Christians that went to China uh, during the Tang Dynasty? Um, and uh, would, would it be possible to say that he kind of looked at that as a model since, you know, they learned Chinese, uh, they dialogued with the Buddhists, there's uh, all kinds of texts that are in Syriac and Chinese, and, you know, even there's, uh, uh, in Syria, there's the Lord Buddha, um, I'm just wondering uh, how familiar he would have been with that. Would that have been a model? And then, and then maybe the second question: uh, Do you think uh, that can be a model today for uh, for modern uh, missionary activity? Yeah, I mean, the, he he learned about the fact that Christians had been in China, and he went to Xi'an looking precisely for uh, uh, Chinese. But there were, even in China at the time, this was completely forgotten. Mm -hmm. This only with the discovery of the stone at the beginning of the 20th century, 
and all the historiography that has gone into the into the uh, Silk Road and the way in which, and of course the people have done the work of how Buddhism was seen in science. So the, every other religion followed the model of Buddhism. So Buddhism had become Chinese to be, and so later also the Syriac, because Buddha and Syriac Christianity really met Buddhism in the in before Islam. Later became all is a, a Muslim role. But it was half Buddhist, half Syriac Christian, I mean, way, even some kingdoms. So it was very important, but they themselves never had the impact on, 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 on China. I mean, the difference here is that you have, on the one hand, uh, they being at the court uh, with the empire and being leading the uh, astronomical observatory of the imperial. The son of heaven is very interested about the science of heaven. So he wanted to have, let's say, astronomers that uh, would give them good science of heaven. Anyhow, so they, they would have both at the very high level, but they also had missions at the very ordinary level. So the first, he knew of them, but really no knowledge in the, in the sense. So it was not a model. The model, in the first, the Jesuits didn't start. I mean, Francis Xavier had no idea how to do it. I mean, it was not a Jesuit. It was only Balignano later, when, we, when he saw the failure of the Portuguese trying to Portugalize the Japanese. And the Japanese gave the Portuguese, look, you never Portugalize us. We call you barbarians. You are barbarians. You don't wash yourself. You stink. So don't come to us and, and don't and don't eat with these barbarian instruments. You have to <laughs> learn how to. So it was, and the same thing with with the Chinese. It was the Chinese Christians. That of course he couldn't have written this book himself in Chinese as much as he was a, a great linguist, mm -hmm. and he had a fantastic memory because you need a fantastic memory to 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 learn, let's say, the two thousand three thousand signs you need to be illiterate, and, and he probably did much much more than that. He could, the Chinese couldn't, couldn't even uh, uh, marvel at the fact they would give him a text. He would uh, read a text from the top to the bottom, and he could repeat every character on the page from the bottom to the top. And so it was a fantastic memory, that's why he suffered his sex. As to the mother today, I would say yes. The mother is, when I mentioned before, Ignatius said, the more universal the good, the more divine. Mm -hmm. But then universal, he understood also the people that had more universal power. So he was understood as the need to get to the kings, and while today, of course, he understood, and of course, he's on the periphery. The Pope says the mission of the Egypt is on the periphery with the refugees, on the frontiers, not at the center. Which I think is a, is a pity because sometimes they let the others define the center ideologies of globalization, and they always were also at the center arguing with what would be the hegemonic uh, ideologies. So I think that this is a, the pastorate of the intelligentsia, where they were, they are abandoning too much, I would argue. It's very important that they go to the peripheries and to have this notion that they from a board, but they shouldn't give up the other pastorate. I also have a question about. Um, my name is Andrei, the Faculty of Theology. So, yeah, you first. Okay. Um, I also want to ask about modern days. How can we like build some bridges with history? Well, if we look at the Orient civilizations, like China, India, J Japan. It all like lost its connections with, with with what it was in the time of, of Jesuits. Like, yeah, yes. Yeah, so it's more like they are more likely and similar to, to what we see here in uh, in Europe or in, uh, in North America, and all um, they are more globalized. And um, if we look in other parts, if you look at our cities, our societies, they are more diverse, they are more divided, and there are so many different groups, so many different um, ideas, and, and so on. So my, my question is, um, can we use this method of Jesuits like, to communicate with, within our like, towns, our cities, our, to, to reach that other? Or it's better to you to find some universal language, not to um, 
find and no, no, not to spend time and, and learn this other the, or use what's, what's this answer? Can it be a, an answer for, for, for our society? As, as I said, they thought, of course, that Christianity was the universal religion. But this religion had to be put in particular languages. And there was no universal language. So Latin had its own metaphysics. I mean, the question is, how do you call the God of creation? Do you call it Yahweh to the Latins? Or do you use the word Deus, which is, of course, the pagan God? And therefore, it has the connotation of pagan gods. They decided to use Deus, in, and they started also in China. So this, was a, this has been a huge debate about which language to use to Christianize, and which, on the one hand, you use the ordinary language of the others. But some, some concepts have to be uh, Christian concepts. But Christian concepts that have to be purified of either Jewish, they are Jewish, or they're Latin, or they're Greek. So in this respect, it has to be a kind of almost a formal code that uh, cannot have too much cultural baggage. So I don't think that there are universal languages. Uh, uh, yeah, mathematics, of course. There are formal universal languages. But as we know from Wittgenstein, and basically even those secondary languages have to rely on the primary language. And these primary languages precisely have a foundation in some particular vision of the world, of the cosmos, of, of humanity, etc. So it always has to be some translation. And that, of course, what we know is that translation happens, you don't get it. You know, translation, we know today that we had to translate the gender relations have been so dramatically changed. They we have to learn to speak a new language, everybody. And precisely, and we are still communicating, as we know, we are still in the midst of this moral revolution going on. And we see how uh, uh, still uh, there are a lot of problems with this moral transformation. And we could go on and on. When you mention uh, Europe, well, Europe, Today, it has to come to terms with religious pluralism. But actually, the way in which Europe solved the problem of the religious wars was by ending pluralism. Who use radio and use religion? Each country only has one religion imposed by the king, unless you have three societies in between, Holland, Germany, and Switzerland, that you cannot get rid of the other completely, and you have to create by confessional structures. Uh, by confessional lender, by confessional cantons, by confessional pillars, and so on. But also through geographical separation. So, uh, and Europe never, as it became modern, there was never growth of religious pluralism. There have never been conversions. People converted from religion to secularity. They left the church, but not to be open to other religions. Europeans, as they became secular, never became open to other religions. You Ukrainians are the only country in Europe that actually broke with the European model of a national church and then a few religious minorities. And you are really, really uh, coming to terms with this very deep religious pluralism that you are experiencing, let's say, in Ukraine. Other countries may have other type of, of pluralism, cultural, moral, moral pluralism. Actually. The most problem we have today, today religious pluralism, although within Islam still does not accept it, there is still resistance, and the theologians may already have and some of the elites, but it's from below, it's the, it's the masses. Even when, when theologians accept in Indonesia, in Pakistan, it's the masses. And they go especially against their own heretics. The ones that really, really oppress and kill, the ones which are killed by other Muslims are their own heretics, really, more even than Christians. But, um, so the, what I'm trying to say is that we have not learned in Europe also to come into terms with religious pluralism. But today the question is not so much religious pluralism, it's which from the United States. The United States came to terms with religious pluralism 200 years ago. And that's been no problem. It's moral pluralism. The notion that there can be actually different moral conceptions for society. 
that people have different moralities. This is what we are fighting today. And is this possible? I mean, uh, somebody like Durkheim, the uh, father of socialism, is impossible. Uh, is society has to have one moral foundation that serves as its sacred morality. So we are, we are not sure exactly to which extent really modern societies can live with deep moral pluralism. Can we accept it? When, when people really, really... So we accept today religious pluralism. We have privatized religion to an extent that uh, modern societies can live with religious pluralism. What we are now really facing is how to live with moral pluralism. Jose, thank you, thank you very much. I see that we uh, uh, on the end our panel, but we really in the beginning our discussions. And thank you very much for more questions for the next uh, our sessions. Professor Kazanova will have zavtra ще lekciju o 10-ti godini na le programe sociologiji, no i me očevedno tako ste kajemo na jeho spilnu prezentaciju iz s profesorom Casey tak, u, u pjatnicu, jak što je ne pomiraju se. Šte raz duže djakuju i ja zaprošuju vsih, kto maje knižku kuplinu česno tud u našem uvedavnictvi, pitkodete za autografom. Šte raz duže vsih djakuju i do nastupnih zustričaj. Thank you very much and for our next meetings.